in Munich, which is about quite big, about five feet high or so, and a triptych format, as you can see, but obviously, or fairly obviously, the wings look like they were added on later. So if we just look at the middle bit, I mean, this is kind of, I don't want to say it's boring, but we've certainly seen uh, pretty well everything here before. It's slightly strange as the very sharp receding perspective as you go on both sides of the composition. Um, we've seen, I mean, basically it's a nativity scene with old Joseph and a couple of shepherds showing up. Pretty nice little crowd of angels all helping out there. Ox and ass, we've seen that ruined stable, we've seen that annunciation of shepherds, we've seen that nice weedy bit there, we've seen that. Not sure who this guy is, he looks a bit, there's one, two of them lurking around in the shadows. So that's not that exactly But what is so interesting is, well, first of all, it, the, the, just these mini donuts, because these, these are the guys, they're called the Paungartner family, if you care, P A U M G A R T N E R. And there they are, usually with, with, we saw that at least one example, boys on one side, girls on the other side sort of thing. So there's all the male members, and on the other side here are the women. And they're kind of cute, aren't they? Uh, anyway, that's a little bit strange, and all rather pious with their rosary beads and things like that. But the, the larger figures on, on, the, on the two wings are actually St. George, Remember George and the Dragon, all those guys, uh, and, oh, hang, well, I can zoom in on the actual thing. They're, they're, so they're looking rather grand, but in a very sort of modern day dress, with the cross of St. George, the flag, uh, half-decent dragon that he's, yeah, that's sort of, sort of all right, sort of holding it up like a sort of trophy, basically. Uh, but that is, in fact, I have to get right, Lucas Pound-Gertner, that's old Lucas right there, uh, and so, you know, the usual thing, if you pay, you're in, but not often quite as obviously as this. And then on the other side, a chap called St. Eustache, uh, and he had, I'm never quite sure what the significance was, but he was sort of a huntsman, he was riding around and he saw a stag that had a little mini crucified Christ between the horns, so that's his identification there. But he is actually a portrait of Stefan Pangetna. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, the two people who, the two male, leading members of the family, they get to be kind of front and centre in the picture. So that, that was a little bit older than that. This is actually kind of what you might call Dura's high renaissance. Uh, because it's really quite grand, it's quite stable and solid the way the high renaissance art is. Uh, and it is obviously, yet again, the adoration of the Magi. Now it's 493 examples of that we've seen, I think. Uh, 1504 it was done, about a metre high, just over three feet high, and it's in the Uffizi. I'm honestly not quite sure how it got there, because it was actually painted for Frederick the Wise, the Elector of Saxony. Uh, and again, I talked a little bit about electors and all the, you know, the divisions of what is now Germany into all these little individual states. So anyway, the idea of aristocratic patronage. And aristocrats like to sort of see themselves represented. So the, the adoration of the kings was a good subject for them. So sort of the earthly kings paying homage to the king of the world, basically. And 99% for sure, uh, the middle of the three kings, that's Dura. So he stuck himself in. Right? And I don't, the others look sort of portrait level. This chap in particular, I don't think he is. And Dura has, I mean, if you think of the word cups and the ingredients, a rather nice sort of conception of Mary. This is the ox who believes the ass is laughing its head off, doesn't believe, that's rather good over there. But the, the, the whole sort of composition, as I said, is very stable. It's kind of a big, giant pyramid that holds everybody together. Uh, and so that was, again, the sort of balance. That's a very high Renaissance thing. So he would have seen Italian example. But the whole background, it's interesting because the background is, um, well, the sort of gateways and the rather rearing horn. There's, there's a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci for actually for the background of his, or it's related to the background of his adoration of the Magi, which is rather similar in some ways to these arches, as I said, rearing horses. So whether or not something like that could travel around and be copied and be used, borrowed by other artists, you never quite know how this, this sort of transition of ideas happens at this time. Even something like Apollo Belvedere that I was just showing you, how did Dora know about that? because there were other versions of it, I guess, before the real thing, or just 
the idealised figure in general. Uh, but again, stairways and things like that, that's a little, little bit enough to people think that Dura must have been aware of this drawing or something similar. Uh, so again, that is a kind of high renaissance thing to do to make quotations from other grand artists. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's uh, again, a pretty good composition. Now this one I'm not honestly so sure about, so we sort of get into a bit of slightly dodgy ground here, and I'm just showing these fairly quickly uh, to get through them. Just uh, obviously a Madonna, about 1505, it's in Washington. And it's actually it's quite small, it's only about 20 inches high. So what happened was, because we had him down in Venice earlier on, about 15, oh, in the fall of 1505, he went back to Venice for another go. He gets, 1494 was when he was there, 11 years earlier on his honeymoon by himself, and now he's gone again by himself. And he's there for 18 months, which is quite a long time to be there looking and studying. He comes back up north in February of 1507. And so he's gone there maybe at least partly to escape from Agnes yet again, but also uh, there's an outbreak of the plague in Nuremberg, so it's a good time to leave town, basically. But most importantly, he's still searching for this elusive secret of um, perfection, idealized beauty that he thinks the Italians can teach him uh, all about. And he was actually very successful in uh, Venice. Uh, German or Germanic traders were hugely um, successful at this time and they spread all around Europe. There, there, were, there were members of something called the Hanseatic League, H-A-N-S-E-A-T-I-C, and they had offices in London and Venice. Every, anywhere you could do trade, they would set up workshops, basically, in warehouses. And the one in Venice is actually still standing. That's the famous Rialto Bridge right there. And this is it's called the Fondaco dei Tedeschi, the warehouse of the Germans, still. And there's a lovely, I found this amazing canaletto. And actually, I, well, I shouldn't go on and on, but it used to belong to my family. There's, there's four of them, the, the four greatest early canalettos still in private hands. And they belong to my family for about 100 years or so. And one good canaletto nowadays goes for about $50 million, $40, 40 $50 million. A set of four, complete with all the documents and everything. Billions! And unfortunately, not mine anymore. Otherwise, I'm not stuck here talking to you lot, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I, I whine too much about these things. Anyway, I mean, they're, they're wonderful because before he sort of went popular, working for all the English tourists and just kind of cranking out repetitions. In fact, the Queen's got copies of this that it's not nearly as good as the original. So, anyway, that's, that's Fondaco over there. And this was other, just to show you sort of how Venice was set up, there's a uh, other sort of markets and things. This was actually rather a nice mix. It was partly the uh, where the, 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 the city treasurers lived here. Uh, plus it was the prison. So you didn't have far to go and you from, from your office cooking your books and then straight into jail basically. And there's a lovely Rialto bridge. The only bridge over the Grand Canal ever. Well, there might be one more modern nowadays. Anyway, very picturesque. But on the outside of this building here, uh, among other people, Giorgione did decorations. That it wouldn't, it wouldn't have quite happened yet. Well, maybe it was happening while Dura was there. Uh, but Giorgione, again, is one of the artists who he's looking at and learning from, and very tragically dies in 1510, just a few years later. He captures the plague and, uh, and dies. But again, quite classically inspired. These are just frescoes being taken off the building in dreadful condition to get a, a tiny idea of what they might uh, have looked like. So anyway, Dura is, is here for long enough to pay off all of his debts back home. When he gets back up north, he buys a big house uh, in Nuremberg. And this again, it's very similar to what Holbein does. He's running back and forth in Switzerland, um, buying big houses in Switzerland and then in London uh, as well. And Dura claimed that all the great painters in Venice were so jealous of his success they actually tried to poison him. And that's the sort of story that the artists make, to sh make up just to show how wonderful they were. Uh, but suddenly he's very happy to learn from uh, the local painters. And this Madonna and Child is certainly related to the kinds of things that the great Giovanni Bellini was doing. He was the teacher of Giorgione, he was the, the brother of the the gentile who did that rather dry view of Venice I showed you. Uh, and this is his Madonna and Child image, which is a little bit similar in the way that he sort of 
frame off the figure with the back cloth and a little bit sort of skinny little bit of landscape uh, on either side. But I think there's a sort of genuine majesty in a way to Bellini's work. I mean, it's quite grand in its own way, even though, again, it's not all that big. And for some, somehow Dura doesn't quite have it. I think he almost sort of oversimplifies, he tries to make it monumental and grand, but he sort of oversimplifies things. And think of all the fussy details in his woodcuts and engravings. And here it's just kind of big blocked out air, areas, uh, trying to achieve a kind of monumentality. And sort of busy stuff on the ledge, I'm not even sure what some of that is, coats of arms and things. And, and then this, I mean, what the hell is this Christ child doing? I mean, he's just not cute at all. Just kind of lounging around with a silly expression. He's got the apple, we've seen that before, you know, taking away this end of the world, that sort of thing. So, I, I mean, it's just, it's not that good, is it? Uh, almost as bad, if not worse, because there's just that much more to be bad, is this thing called the Madonna Child with the Siskin, S-I-S-K-I-N. Uh, this is 1506, it's in Berlin, again, it's big-ish, it's almost a meter high, a little bit of a, a similar background with those sort of archy things, to the, all ruined to the uh, background with the adoration of the Magi. But again, very similar format to Giovanni Bellini, who was doing sort of landscapes with a cloth that comes from God knows where, and then you sort of frame the Madonna Child in front of that, basically. Uh, and full of sis symbols here, more than you would normally get. The siskin, I'm sure you're dying to know, is that bird that's perched on his arm. And it's sort of like a, a bit like a goldfinch, it's a, it's a symbol of the, of the passion and Christ's death. Uh, the book held by Mary, that's again, we've seen that, you know, the Old Testament scriptures that. Uh, fulfilled by the, you know, prophecies fulfilled by the coming of Christ. There's, there's a little John the Baptist with an angel and they're bringing flowers, lilies, things like that. Tons of, even, see, even that, um, see the piece of paper that's kind of folded up and throwing a little shadow down, a little bit of sort of trombone in the foreground. Even that he kind of steals from, well, it's not the best example, from Bellini, where very often he has his signature on a little bit of um, sort of floating paper almost. But it just, again, it's just kind of weird. It doesn't really sort of uh, make it in a way. I mean, we see that all the bits of it, and they had crown, for example, and red and white roses, but her face is hardly conventionally beautiful somehow. The crown is actually held by, you know, a bit little cherubim and seraphim, who again are not totally cute. In fact, they're sort of annoying. You just want, you just want to give them a kick. <laughs> not too much of a sign. There's a wonderful writer called Bill Bryson who writes travel books. And he's, he's a, I, I used to take him when I travel around and I go to a restaurant. I, I had to stop reading his books because I'd just be shouting with laughter and I'd scare the other people at the restaurant. Uh, but he does one thing. He's, he's in England and he's, he's watching. He's down at the sort of the, the, the seafront and all these grand ladies are walking their little peak and easy dogs and, he, and he says, "Don't you want to just go up and kick them?" He said, not from any bad feeling against the dog, you just want to see how far they go. <laughs> and I think that's, every time I see a little tiny dog, I really have this awful urge to rush out and kick it, just see how far, because I used to kick for my school rugby team. And the same kind of thing with these, I mean, I'd love to, to see, could probably get a 50-yard field goal with one of these guys. But see, I mean, that's, that's not that grand, it's not divine, it's not anything, it's just sort of, um, you know, it just doesn't quite work somehow. Uh, and this is, this is, again, a little bit too much for your money. And some, actually, I should have mentioned that it was, this one was probably painted as a thank you for, to Giovanni Bellini, who would probably be much happier with a spaghetti dinner or something than getting this. You know, eat off well, thanks. Uh, then what do you do with it? Uh, anyway, this is another one that's a, oh, it's sort of too grand for its own good. It's called the, the Feast of the Rose Garden. It's a very, very interesting picture. Um, garlands as in all of the garlands that have been sort of carried around there. Uh, 1506, and it's pretty big, it's over five feet high, um, over six feet wide, about two meters wide. And it's in Prague, where I've never been, so I've never actually seen the real thing. But it was painted for a church in Venice. And this actually might be the reason why, if, if the Venetians were jealous, it was because of this, because you know this was a pretty plum commission, and they would have probably felt it should have gone to one of them. But it was this was 
friend of the church of San Bartolomeo, St. Bartholomew, which was the German church in Venice. So obviously they're going to give the commission to one of their own, uh, basically, all these Hanseatic League uh, merchants. And I should say this picture has been very, very badly damaged. It's been overpainted, especially in the 19th century. But still, I mean, it's a very, very striking image. Again, very solid. You can see the basic sort of high Renaissance kind of triangular pyramid composition holding everything together, but a little bit overcrowded uh, somehow. Because what, what's happening is that uh, Christ child crowning on one side, Mary crowning on the, on the other side, the Pope and the Emperor. So it's church and state, the two dueling factions within Europe that, that we've been talking about uh, so often at this time, the spiritual and the temporal uh, world, and the crowns made of red and white roses, which again, in this context, sort of symbolize the rosary, uh, apparently. And in behind the Pope, there are all these other kind of religious characters. They're all being given their crowns by St. Dominic. Remember the Dominicanes, the black and white, the dogs of the Lord? So they're all happily lining up there. Uh, getting their start. And then on this side, the lay men uh, behind the emperor, of knights in armor, and things like that. And then behind that, there is Dura himself with a friend, and he's holding a big label, basically saying hello. Actually, who the friend is, it's a fellow called uh, Girolamo Tedesco, who you don't have to worry about. But he was the architect of that warehouse in, in Venice. So again, this is a so the solidarity with the Germans right there, and a very alpine-looking landscape in behind, that's rather nice. But Dura, very often, as we'll see, shows up in his pictures, just to sort of, the big signature, if you like, to, to stamp his own uh, presence in these particular uh, works. So you're stress stressing here just the Germanicness of everything. And in fact, what we're looking at is the, the Pope is actually Julius II, who is the Sistine seedling man, and the Vatican Stanze, the St. Peter's itself, all commissioned by him. And the Emperor is Maximilian I, who's actually on the brink of invading Italy. Give him about another ten minutes, he'll be raising his troops to go and attack this guy. So it's all kind of tense. But artistically, they hang out together because they're all sort of equal under God. And that's basically the idea. So again, you can't really judge it, as I say, because it has been so badly damaged. But I think, again, the trouble with Dura is, in the, we saw in the watercolors, less is more, basically. You know what to leave out. And in this case, almost more is more. Too much of a good thing. And, and the trouble in some ways that artists, our historians tell me that there's no sort of really logical development. I mean, a lot of artists, they get what they want to do and then they basically stick to it. Other artists are going to change and mature a little bit. And he does that certainly in the watercolors, woodcuts, and graffiti. But in the paintings, he seems to hop and skip and dodge around all over the place somehow. Uh, so that, again, it's, I mean, you wouldn't know which came before or after, because this is just different. Uh, and and it's, it's, um, it's also painted in 1506. It's actually now in the Tyson collection, which is in T-H-Y-S-S-E-N, in Madrid. The greatest private collection that I've ever put together. And what it shows is Christ Among the Doctors. And this was where, well, I meant, I should say, it was actually painted in Rome. He's gone zipping down to Rome for a fairly quick visit. And I think, I can't remember if I mentioned last time, that 1500 self-portrait, yeah, I did say that. Uh, I said that was the last painted self-portrait, but there was the one that apparently he gave to, 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 to Raphael. So he would have presumably met Raphael, who at that time, well, he hasn't quite started the Pope's apartments. Um, Actually, no, he wouldn't. Have. He's not even quite in Rome yet. How would that happen? Raphael was still in Florence, but he would sort of assume that Dura traveling down to Rome would go by way of Florence, and maybe they're hooked up there. Anyway, what he does is in, in Rome, he's there not very long at all, and sort of almost a side trip down from Venice. And this picture is actually called the Five Day Wonder because it's very quickly painted, very thinly painted, you know, sort of wash, almost washes of color. Uh, the monogram that we keep seeing, uh, the signature is on this kind of page marker, the bookmark sticking out of the pages here. And this is what I, I think I've sort of mentioned this before, but because remember the flight into Egypt and the rest of the flight into Egypt? I mean, all it said in the Bible is that they went to Egypt. It doesn't even say they came back. It picks up when Christ was 12 years old and he sort of disappears and his parents are really worried because, as you would be, 
And finally they track him down. He's in the synagogue. He's arguing with all these rabbi types. Uh, and they are all amazed by his youthful genius and not very happy about it, obviously, because he's showing them up. And anyway, that's quite a popular theme in art, but never painted ever quite uh, like this. And again, what we have is the idea, and we've sort of seen this before, of a kind of mixer of very real, but then sometimes very caricature uh, faces, because what we're talking about basically is narrow-minded, um, sticking to the word, but not understanding the meaning of the word somehow. Um, you know, just the rule book, rules, rules, rules all the time, rather than the true spirit of, of, of God. Uh, and, and this rather ominous faces, staring in, sliding eyes, things like that. Going on. So it makes you think a little bit of Bosch's um, crowning of thorns that I showed a little while ago. Um, not that Durer would have known it, I and mean, he could have known a version of it perhaps, but it's more just to get sort of the idea of you know, piling up to the top of the picture, rather flat, everybody you know, pushed to the front of the picture. Uh, and again, this rather odd mix of very real and very kind of cartoony almost. It's strange, isn't it? But I mean, Durer is wonderful at hand. I mean, there's extraordinary... The whole, I mean, you're not supposed to put face heads right up at the top of the picture. They should be more sort of centered a little bit further down and according to the strict rules of composition. But these amazing hands, because you get this sort of fellow beside him whose sort of hands are just kind of waving around. And this is... You see Durer, the Christ hand there, he's got his finger on his thumb. That's the sort of emblematic of logical argument, you're sort of numbering off your points in a, in a very reasonable kind of way, as opposed to the kind of vague ideas expressed by this fellow. And this beautifully serene face of Christ. Uh, and again, so I said, it's sort of, no, no, they're beautifully done. They remind me a little bit of that study of the old man, uh, some of these. But there's the detail of the hands. It's just quite wonderfully done. So within us, a rather strange picture, there's a very effective area there. And there's this stunningly beautiful... Oh, sorry, I, think I should have... Yeah, I, for that, that's actually by Mantegna, who was an amazingly interesting northern Italian, who was actually the brother-in-law of the Bellini family. They tried to kind of um, scout him out and get him to come and work for them in, in, in Venice, and they sort of gave him the daughter to get him to come along there. But, uh, he kept working in places like Mantua and so, but he also did, this is the adoration of the Magi, also this rather claustrophobic, you know, spaceless uh, image with the, with the head right up at the top, even if the head like that is a little bit similar. So maybe he'd seen a version of that somewhere, but this is the drawing that he did for Christ's head, it's absolutely beautiful. And again, you'd have to think of the, a sort of an engraver drawing somehow, with the way that the lines are in there, but just to, to, so, so the other thing, I mean, this is a preparatory drawing. You don't have to do something that's finished and one of this for your preparatory drawing. You just sort of outline the features and sort of nail the expression a little bit, but it doesn't have to be as polished and finished. So I think, as I was mentioning last time, the idea of collecting drawings. Yeah? Is this one of those silver green ones? I, do, I don't know. I don't know if it is or not. And it should be on more slightly bluer paper than this as well. Does it, I mean, it's hard to say if it's silver point or not. I, I sort of doubt it, but it could be. You'd have to go and Google it. No, that doesn't look like silver point there for sure. That would be like ink? That, that looks almost washy, sort of ink and wash, rather than silver. But yeah, and then highlighted with white. I'm not, I'm not, it's not a fair question because I'm not, I don't know yeah. how to do it, so you know much better than I do. If I could do it myself, very, if I could do this sort of thing, again, I'm not stuck here talking to you lot. I'd be out there just enjoying myself somewhere. Only frustrated artists become art historians. In my next life, I'm going to learn watercolors. <laughs> but again, you know, again, I shouldn't go on and on, but that same collection that had the Canalettos, the first, when it was all sold off just before I was born, the first 39 lots were all Turner watercolors. And some of the most famous ones in the world that go for sort of 15, 20 million bucks a pop nowadays. And because nobody paints watercolor like that. So why, why would I ever paint a watercolor? Because I know what I could or should be doing. And I could never do it as good as Turner. So, I mean, it's not a good excuse, is it? Otherwise, you'd never do anything. Uh, but it would just be too frustrating. If it, so, anyway, I just, I'm just 
this talk. Uh, anyway, a couple of portraits, because I mean, he does it, two of these things uh, uh, in Venice, and they're, they're awfully good, and, and they're not, again, quite conventional, but they're unconventional in a good way, rather than just sort of, uh, I think, anyway. And this is just uh, for a young woman, 1505, and it's now in Vienna. It's quite small, it's only 12 inches high. And apparently her costume is, is Milanese from Milan, so actually that in case you didn't know that, you know, the, the Milan, Milan was one of the great centers of the rag trade, and the word milliner, you know, for somebody who made clothes out actually comes from the city of Milan, uh, today's bit of useless trivia. Uh, and it's, it's actually, it's not quite finished. Uh, I mean, the face is pretty well done, but you can see perhaps the, the ribbon not equally complete. Uh, not, nobody knows him, but it's, it's really lovely, and everybody does, just the way that the hair falls. Again, you sort of think almost of a printmaker, uh, rather than a painter doing those little highlights and things like that. So one, maybe he's too good at too many different media that, you know, one sort of seems to trickle over into the other. But it's, it's rather harsh in a way, rather hard-edged, and very sort of unconventionally beautiful, I guess you could say, but it sure works in that sort of rather modest attitude. We've seen lots of portraits leading up to this. Very fashionable, obviously very wealthy. This would be presumably commissioned by her or her husband, perhaps. Uh, we just don't know who. And then the other one is this one, which I think is even more amazing. Because, I mean, look at this, as I say, it's, it's kind of uh, almost like a color drawing in a way, the outlining and then sort of the, the details are quite precise. Now this one is much softer and more atmospheric, and really simplified, just as sort of the two blues, which almost suggest sort of water and sky, and then the simplicity of the face. I love it, because she's rather severe, uh, but there's a little bit of hair that flies loose there, and that sort of humanizes her to a certain extent. And he's stuck his name, you see the AD is almost like it's embroidered into a box, as if he's sort of putting his mark on her. So I'm just wondering if this isn't, because again she's anonymous, just portrait of a woman. She's in Berlin, this one, and she's only 11 inches, so again they're quite small and But I'm just wondering if this isn't a special friend uh, who we would met in Venice. Because remember Agnes is back home in Nuremberg, uh, so maybe this is a more private image. But that kind of soft modeling of this, totally different from that. Like, remember, again, I mean, you, you don't know quite how much to do influences in art, but, but Leonardo da Vinci, after he painted the Last Supper, whips across northern Italy before he goes back down to Florence. And he's in Rome for about eight minutes. And suddenly, almost, it seems that Venetian art changes from being hard edged and brittle, sort of enamel like colors, to soft, atmospheric, Leonard esque style. So somehow he had a chat with Giorgione and Bellini and got them to change their way somewhere. And this is really quite similar to the sort of that, that softness of the modeling. This is a quite a famous, well I'm not sure if you could call it a portrait, but by George Germany called Laura, L-A-U-R-A. See all the laurel branches in behind us, there's a pun on the name. And Petrarch, the famous writer, he had a lady friend called well, Laura, Laura, so it's probably her. But it's just, it's the more just the way it's painted somehow is that, um, getting away from hard edge, sort of drawing and colouring it into something that's a little bit more. And, and even the mood, she's rather beautifully introspective and thoughtful, a little bit similar there. So I think that's pretty special, again, quite different. Um, but if, if you're doing the official people, you have to do it the right way, really. And this is Maximilian the first, the emperor, the one who was in that sort of group portrait that I showed you a minute ago. 1519 this was done, it's in Vienna. So the Holy Roman Emperor, I mean, this is about as good as it gets socially, uh, the, the rival of, of, of the Pope. So all about him, you've got the coats of arms, you've got a long inscription, inscription telling us how wonderful he is. Uh, this is sort of the more conventional job of the portrait to provide information to show us who, how significant and wonderful this person was. The, see, he's got a pomegranate in his hand, which in this uh, context of his immortality, his reputation will live forever because he's just so wonderful. Uh, and for years and years and years, this sort of hung in a great long line of rather dry ancestor portraits, basically in the old palace in Vienna, and then they realized that it was newer and it was superior to the others, so they hauled it out of that context and stuck it in the museum, basically, as a work of art. 
because that's how we would see it nowadays rather than just a sort of document uh, somehow. So he's rather grand and snooty and look, looking down his nose at us. And remember that I mean, he's starting to get the Habsburg chin, which will be a re get, you know, pretty soon they're all blithering idiots and you, you, they can hardly chew their food because they're, again, don't keep marrying your cousins and your nieces and things like that. That's, if you don't get anything else out of this course, just remember those words. <laughs> Uh, and I like this one because it's just so, it's just, it's so much it seems very modern somehow, doesn't it? It's very sparse. To, again, no, I mean, he could have maybe had a landscape in a window or something, but just the, the clear black background, this tough looking face. I mean, if you take the costume off him, he could belong to, he could belong to any age, basically. Uh, just a sort of thuggish character. And actually, who he is is an extraordinary interesting man called Jakob Fugger, F U G G E R. And Durer's got his pendants around 1520 or so, it's in Munich. And he was the fellow, uh, I mean, I've sort of mentioned him by implication because uh, well, he, he was based in Augsburg, which is sort of southeastern Germany nowadays. And he was called Jakob Fugger the Rich for rather obvious reasons because he was the one who, well, first of all, he was the banker to both the emperor and the pope. So he was just bleeding money out of both sides of this great rivalry. And he actually funded the election of the Emperor Charles V, the son of Maximilian, in 1919. Because again, like nowadays, you know, all the corporate sponsorships of politicians, it was just as bad then, if not worse, than it is nowadays. But he was the one who had the, one of the main sources of his wealth, if not the main source, he had the franchise for selling indulgences in his whole area in Germany. And that again, remember, was the tickets to heaven that Martin Luther objected to so much. Uh, when he starts complaining about corruption in the church, that's actually the first thing he, he talks about. It. And I said, you know, the Gutenberg printing press, it wasn't the Bible, it was indulgences, tickets to heaven that they printed off first. So he was, it's like a sort of pizza pizza franchise thing, he, he got all the revenue from all the tickets to heaven. And so, that's kind of a nice way to earn a living without actually having to work all that hard. But I do think it's a good portrait because it just, very direct, very thuggish looking character. Okay, that's enough of the portraits from it. So, Adam and Eve, you recognize them by now, I hope. Uh, and I, I, they're, they're sort of life size, they're huge things, which is very impressive. The pictures of themselves are about seven feet high. They're in the Prado, and he does them in 1507. So again, you would think lots of influence, because he's been in Italy for quite a while now, lots of influence of classical ideals of the perfect, perfect human body, that sort of idea. Uh, the usual, I mean, you've got a rather nice little simplified ground that they stand on. With some, I'm sure, I bet they mean something. All these rather nice shells and little stones and bits and pieces like that. Uh, and she gets to have the tree next to her, because she needs a tree to have snakes and apples, you know, the tree of knowledge. Uh, and all this well-behaved shrubbery that just kind of dangles in just all the right places, basically. Uh, but again, you see, it's sort of, in some ways, it's kind of textbook. It is, um, it's sort of a manifesto of his, his ideas about ideal proportions. Uh, because otherwise, you know, maybe a little bit more landscape. So he just isolates the figure and just, boom, there they are, standing un come unencumbered with all the other bits and pieces. So again, you look at, I mean, you think of the Apollo Belvedere, for example, as a model for this, but there was also, where is he? There's this other famous, famous almost more influential than Apollo Belvedere, which is this chap called the Spear Bearer, uh, by an artist called, a sculptor called Doriferous, middle of the fifth century, about the same time that the sculptures of the past not have been done in Athens. And this was, actually was a textbook illustration. He wrote a whole book about the perfect proportion of the human body, which unfortunately is lost. But we have the illustration. Well, actually, this is a, there are lots and lots of these are marble copies that mostly Romans did after a lost bronze original. And again, it's the idea of contraposto, weight on one leg, get one arm up. I mean, think of Michelangelo David. The only reason he's standing like that with his arm up is to do contraposto so that Michelangelo can refer back to antiquity, uh, and then the relaxed leg, relaxed arm, a slight turn of the head, and the weight on one leg slightly tilts the torso, and the pelvis, the torso, everything twists and turns, 
animate it as opposed to the earlier ones, which are absolutely dead and frontal and just not really going anywhere. Uh, so it's partly textbook proportions, and again, the head goes into the body seven times, things like that. But it's also a little bit more humanized compared to some of the early ones, but it provides a good model for later Renaissance artists for, to, who want to refer back to that sort of thing. And again, she would be sort of echoing back to statues of, um, of Venus. But again, this tiny head, and this we've seen that over and over again, where the, the, the male figures are pretty realistic, naturalistic, whatever the word would be. And the females are sort of more generalized, and, and you sort of wonder if the, the artist has ever really looked that closely at a, a nude female. And, and they're rather good in the detail. And I like her slightly shifty expression. Because, I mean, this, don't forget, this is nearly all uh, done by men, for men. So you, it's very sexist. And so always it was Eve's fault, because, again, remember that poor old Adam was just the dumb guy doing what he was told. Uh, so you get, she gets to be the villain of the piece. It's sort of men as the victims of scheming, plotting females, basically. If you remember that description I gave of Dura's wife last week, then last time, then maybe that might be his own personal opinions as well. But I mean, remember going back to all the way back to good old Adam and Eve by, by what's his name, Van Eyck? Just that. Yeah. yeah, you remember him? Yeah. I mean, again, see, that was so real with the shadows and the suntan, and then she's rather kind of not quite right. Unless the shape of women has really changed over the centuries more than men's have, which I sort of doubt. But there aren't that many women that look quite like that, I don't think. Uh, anyway, I, mean, this, the, the idea, I don't think Dura was, but uh, I'd rather was so much looking at a, kind of a textbook illustration of perfection. But Dura certainly was, because it ties all in with his sort of research and his, the publishing that he's going to do a little bit later on. So uh, I think this is clearly a kind of manifesto, you might put it that way. And if you think, you know, just not, this is about what is about three years earlier. I mean, it's, in some ways, it's quite similar. Um, again, you're sort of harking back to antiquity, the distinction between the male and the female. Uh, but he's certainly come a long way, I think, just in a rather kind of short period of time. Now, a couple of other uh, paintings by Dura, because I wonder, actually we won't quite have time today, probably the real superstars I'll get to next week, but when we get back into the engravings, because they're too complica complicated to, well, I might do one of them today, we'll see how far we get. Anyway, I mean, to me, this, this, is, this is just nasty, uh, because there's just too bloody much going on. Uh, I can't go in that far. Uh, and it's called The Massacre of the Ten Thousand, The Martyrdom of the Ten Thousand. Now, if you're going to do the model of the British Ten, you don't actually have to show all 10,000 people. You just sort of imply that there are more. Uh, it looks like he's got every single one of them in here, well, almost. And so, again, it's a little bit of overkill uh, in every sense of the word. Uh, and this was done in case you care, 1508. It's about a metre high, so not huge, luckily, but again, the cast of thousands somehow. And it's all about a fellow called King Shapur of Persia, who's the chap on the nice horse here with the big, with the big turban on, uh, and he kills, orders the killing of all these Christians. So it's about dying for your faith, things like that, but it's, it's, again, it's a little bit um, too, and there, there's a few headless people lying around, but uh, it's, it's, almost like a, it's almost like a crucifixion as well, with the people sort of dangling from crosses here. Uh, but the fact that just so many people kind of, I mean, you just take one or two or three and then suggest this awful event, I think it might be slightly more effective. What's always interesting, though, is that so often he actually includes himself, right? But see, there he is with his, I'm not sure who he is, it might be Vinibald Birkheimer, remember him, uh, standing in the middle, and very often he has a big summer sideboard saying, hello, I'm German. Quite patriotic. Uh, but again, a couple of little details. He's, he's rather, I like him with his. You see, he could have got borrowed that stuff. From, remember, I showed you that drawing of people with turban, sort of borrowing it out of some Venetian art, because it looks sort of exotic and different. Uh, and there's people all there. Uh, and that's how, now the other one, which again, I think is, it's, if I were, well, I, I would, you, you sort of 
like he was standing next to Dura with a big stick, saying, come on, stop it, don't do that, that's just, just annoying. You know, simplify, purify, all of that sort of thing. But just to give you an idea, again, of another sort of slightly overkill one, and how he just doesn't, and I'm being sort of slightly overcritical, when you see the real things, they really are quite splendid. But this, it's, it's called the Trinity. And I'm just showing you that to show you the overall frame as well, which is quite elaborate, as you can see. But zooming in on the actual altarpiece, uh, this is about 15, 1508 to 1511, which is almost exactly the same time that, that Michelangelo is doing the ceiling and Raphael's doing the, the Pope's apartment in uh, Rome. Uh, it's uh, only about four and a half feet high or so. It's not that huge. And it was done actually for the chapel. It is an altarpiece for the almshouse, you know, where they looked after poor people in Nuremberg, and paid for by the chap who's over there, the rather ha hairy fellow uh, with a slightly ominous looking friend in behind. Uh, his name was Matthaus Landauer, L A N D A U E R. And the focus basically is on the Trinity, because that's sort of what it's all about. But the Trinity is being adored by, back to St. Augustine, yet again, his city of God. It's sort of an encyclopedia of all of us, uh, everybody who's ever existed, again, the cast of thousands, all these virgin martyrs on this side, and uh, Moses, I mean, there's lots of, and there's David with his harp. I mean, there's just, again, John the Baptist, there's just too much going on, some, and all the heavenly host up here, down with the Holy Spirit, God, this is the Trinity, straight up and down there. And so, you know, it just, I bet Dura's in here somewhere. Oh, there, look, there he is, standing with a big sign saying, Albert, Albert, Dura, Gloricus, yet again. So, hello. It's like a sort of Where's Waldo thing, you know, that he keeps popping up. But it's just it's just sort of busy. And what he was trying to do, essentially, I think, well, what he can't do, because again, he doesn't know about this at all. But see, this is Raphael's vision of the same theme, in a way, the Trinity, in one of the Pope's rooms in, in the Vatican. And again, you've got to go there and see the real things. It's really quite extraordinary to, you know, how brilliant these things are. But it, it should... Raphael knows how to kind of um, organize the crowd, basically, and he's very clever. I mean, even when you're in the room, the, the sort of perspective leading you in, your eye level is sort of looking kind of straight through, so there's sort of like he's, all this happens beyond the flat surface of the wall. Uh, I mean, he's a master choreographer, and, the, and the, what you have is you've got the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and it's all about transubstantiation. I don't want to get too much. Remember the idea that uh, the, the body and the the, the bread and the wine actually miraculously transform into the, uh, the, the, the blood and the body of Christ. And that was something that the Protestants in particular were questioning. So Julius II commissioning this said, no, this is true. And God the Father, God the Holy Son, God the Holy Spirit think it's true as well. Because they're all lining up above the altar here. Uh, but the way that he does the sort of arcing of the heavens, because these are all of the saintly characters up here. Uh, in the sort of heaven is up, and then all the earthly characters, many of whom are still sort of arguing and discussion, discussing what's going on down here. That's actually Julius II. I mean, on and on and on, you can talk about this. But just sort of better organized. With, with Raphael, the phrase often attached to him is the parts are subordinated to the whole, which means you know, each individual thing is interesting in its own right, but they kind of disappear in the big picture somehow. And the big picture is what kind of, And here, again, although individual bits are really rather interesting, some of the draperies and things like that are rather nice. And again, that idea of a little low landscape. But people, there's just too much. People get lost in the shuffle. So, but again, it's not fair to compare to Sir Raphael because he's just a superstar. Now, again, what happens, maybe luckily, in a way, who are less and less and less. Uh, paints in the last few years of his life. More printmaking, more theoretical stuff. And so, look, in case you, I mean, all these foreshortenings of things we've been seeing, in case you're ever wondering how to do that, uh, this is the, the, the sort of the, the illustrations out of his books, uh, basically to teach. Because uh, I'm, I'm not, not going to show you again those scary, idealized figures that, that, that are just.
just so weird. But this is useful stuff. Uh, and what you do is you have, well, it's actually it's slightly more better with, because it could be a loot, or it could be a, you have to get a nice naked lady to lie down on the other side and see there's a grill thingy there, then you get a squared off piece of paper there, and you copy down square by square. You can all run home and try and do this. Uh, which makes, because if you try and do the whole thing at once, you're going to mess it up. It just won't look good. But if you do it piece by piece, it'll work. But you have to get a sharp point you stick and sharp that up your nose, I guess, just to keep your head steady. Uh, and it's, it's, it's all practical, useful advice. So he's doing this sort of thing. Uh, he is, actually, well, he's still doing lots of prints, the, the woodcuts, the engravings. Uh, 1525, for example, he publishes his great treatise on the teaching of measurements with ruler and compass. I'm sure you've all read that. Uh, and then the art of fortification, that's 1527. Seeing how many great artists, Michelangelo, were all really interested in fortifying buildings and cities and things. Uh, I mean, it was a real art form in many ways. And 1528, the year of his death, uh, and he published his four books on human proportion, which is what I showed you chunks of earlier on. But also what he wrote was, I think this is rather useful for all of you, when I was young, I craved variety and novelty. Now in my old age, I've begun to see that simplicity is the ultimate goal of art. So again, a sort of less is more. So in fact, I think these are these are about his last major pictures, paintings, uh, 1526, so he's only got a couple of years left. The Four Apostles. And I think, you know, if you had to pick a successful painting by uh, Dura, it would probably be this. And what we're looking at are the four figures of St. Mark, no, hang on, um, John the Evangelist and St. Peter, and St. Mark and St. Paul. And they, oh, well, I've got to, to find that chart. Somebody took that chart. Again, just to give you an idea of the size. Uh, because they're, well, about seven feet high. So again, it's a life-size figure. And, and look, see, can you all identify what's hanging down the wall of it? What's that? Who did that? Who did that? Van Eyck. Two Cranachs that I showed very quickly last week. Remember the, the mocking of Christ and the crucifixion? So you all failed, sorry. Uh, that was my secret final exam for the course. <laughs> um, anyway, so, I mean, they're, they're really quite spread. So they're in Munich if, if you happen to be there, which you probably won't be. Uh, and they're not, they're not wings of an altarpiece, we've seen that so often. They're, it's actually a complete work of art in its own uh, right. And actually painted for the town council of Nuremberg. And there are texts down at the bottom. That's actually all writing down there. And it's all, again, sort of written, it's all taken, sort of the writings of the, of the apostles, but in the translation of Martin Luther, the Protestant. And nobody knows exactly how much Dura ever sort of leaned towards the Protestant cause. Uh, he certainly seems to have been sympathetic to the idea of reform, but most sensible human beings were. And even Raphael in Rome apparently used to go to secret meetings about how to get rid of all this corruption in the church. But uh, again, you had to do it pretty carefully if you were actually in Rome. And so again, it's the idea of the emphasis on the word of God uh, that we see down at the bottom uh, of the image. But look at look up. I mean, they're so solidly done. I sort of criticised him earlier in that with the image of being almost overly simple. But I think this is genuinely monumental, genuinely grand. These wonderful sculptural folds of drapery. Look at that beautiful stuff there. It's just amazingly well done. Uh, and then the expressions. I'll come back to that in a second. Again, individually representing sort of different human characteristics uh, somehow. And, as I say, the Word of God being emphasized, as opposed to sort of general Roman Catholic kind of spiritualism, I guess you could say. Because what you're talking about, I mean, even the fact that John the Evangelist, the Word of God, pushes St. Peter into the background. And Peter looks very old and tired, and a little bit sort of almost into... And, and Peter, as we've seen with the fast pope, he was always being pushed forwards by... Uh, by Catholic art, and now he's just sort of playing second fiddle. And he's still got his keys, just so we know who he is. But John certainly, you know, 
bigger and stronger. So I, I've never quite understood this, because if Peter is pushed into the background, so surely should St. Paul, because Peter and Paul were the two arch heroes, basically. And this is Paul in the foreground, who is this wonderfully powerful image with the sword of his martyrdom, uh, with Mark almost looking a little bit, almost enviously along in uh, the background. So I, and that I can't quite uh, explain, presumably there's a, an obvious reason for it. Uh, but I think, again, there's, a, there's a, a real sense of the significance of these figures, uh, just the way that they're represented. And what we have to also see, and this is getting back to the idea of, of the, uh, the four humans that I talked about with the Adam and Eve thing. Actually, I'm not, I don't think I've got all four, so I'll just do it from there. Because St. John represents the sanguine. Four humans are also called the four temperaments. Four, and even the sort of four kinds of religious experience, you might, you might say. So St. John, John the Evangelist is sanguine. Peter is phlegmatic. Uh, Mark is choleric. He's the angry guy. And sort of a, a bit of fanatic in a way. And then Paul is melancholic, rather brooding and sullen in the foreground. And the fact that really in the runway bit about that, when, when I finished it before the break, that, that lovely old geezer head. It's rather good. Oh, there, oh, there he is again. What, what are the odds? I forgot to put him in there. And there's Mark, because he looks a little bit sort of angered, so he's choleric again. And there's Paul, really making eye contact somehow. So I'll do this one, then I'll save the other two for next week, because, you know, we've had enough of it. Because what we've got is a group of three engravings, which I think are his absolute, sort of, ultimate genius experience. Wednesday. What? You're really the next event. I'll this get to Wednesday. the next two. Next Wednesday. Next, yeah. On Wednesday, yeah. Um, so this is this is called Melanch Melancholia One. Um, and the other two are Night, Death and the Devil and St. Jerome in his study. So, Melancholia, and, and I, was, I think they were clearly designed to go as a set, uh, basically. Uh, they're all done in 1514, 1514, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, if you like as well, because there's an enormous amount going on here. Uh, and, and so this is one of Dura's greatest, I mean, also in some ways one of the most depressing, uh, I think you'd have to say. The other two really aren't. Uh, but are clearly designed to appeal to a highly educated, a highly dis discerning uh, audience, as opposed to, particularly to the woodcuts, which were more for uh, sort of general root. Uh, use. And just to sort of, again, just zooming in a little bit on the technical stuff, I mean, it's very hard to imagine anything better than this. Uh, and, and I should also say that there's a huge amount of stuff, I have no idea what's going on in this sort of numerology that's, that's happening. It's a magic square. What do you? It's a magic square. It is a magic square. It's one of those sort of Sudoku kinds of things. They all add up to 34. Everything adds up to what? 34. 34. Thank you very much. I wonder what you did your paper on. Not that. Not it wasn't this? Okay. <laughs> um, no, I mean, but the, I mean that's where you have to read through detail by detail. And I did a long time ago, and I've forgotten it all, so that's all right. So that gets you off the hook a little bit, because if I don't know, then you don't have to know. Uh, but ringing your bells, that's got to mean something. Uh, and our, I mean, that's our hourglasses, signs of time running out. Because actually, you can see the sands actually are running out there. Uh, so we're all going to die. So it's sort of the vanitas transient theme. Uh, scales, we've seen that, you know, the, the weighing of souls, we've seen that all the time. And on and on and on. But then the, the title of the word, Melancholia, it's actually Melancholia 1. Uh, this banner that's been flown across this great sunburst in the background, above this, again, another stunningly beautiful little slice of a, a, a sort of harbour scene, uh, there's a weird bat creature thingy that's carrying the banner, sort of whooshing around there. And, but again, all, yeah, all just the technical stuff as well, it's just, it's just quite 
uh, extraordinary. So then the other things are, again, most of us nowadays, if we ever knew it at all in the first place, don't have the sort of knowledge that you need to appreciate uh, something like this. So you assume that the audience, I mean, he's not just doing this for his own entertainment, that there would be people there like Pinabel, bit kinder, who would have known what was going on. In fact, maybe even suggested some of the content, some of the, uh, the subject matter. Lots of artists work with philosopher friends to get all the ideas in, into place. Uh, and again, there's, there's, if, you, if you do bother to read up on it, there's absolutely no agreement whatsoever, which is kind of good, but also uh, confusing and bad uh, in some ways. But melancholia, I mean, just what I was saying, that's sort of my segue in the way, he was melancholy in this one. And this is the figure, that we've seen that before, the idea of the, the figure slumped, fist to the face, that's melancholia, that's the body language. So whoever this figure exact actually represents, she's not having a good day, basically. And so why is she slumped into this particular uh, pose? It's something to do with, I think, the, well, the melancholic humor, in case you didn't know, makes you sluggish, lazy, surly, mournful, absent-minded, clumsy, stingy, greedy, malicious, cowardly, unfaithful, irreverent, and sleepy. Did you get all that? Uh, anyway, so, so it's all sort of negative stuff in so many different ways. And remember melancholy was all the way back to good old Hugo van der Hoos that they played nice loops at and he felt quite a lot better. Uh, I don't see any loops in here to make this figure feel better at all. Uh, but see, there's all these sort of carpentry things, there are planes and saws and nails, um, claw hammery kinds of things, and on and on and on, bags, bags of money, this slightly odd looking cow thingy there, a hammer over there, it's almost Masonic some of this stuff, there's a, a water wheel there, the, the, see, the, the trouble with melancholia, it, it sort of freezes you, you can't do anything, you can't get anything done just because you're so melancholic and you just sort of locked in your own, and it's a pose that you're locked in. If, if you know Michelangelo's uh, Medici tombs, there's two figures, one's active and one contemporary, and the, and the, the contemporary figure is sort of, again, locked in this melancholic pose, but he's also got his feet, difficult to say where this one's feet are, uh, in the Michelangelo, the feet are kind of, you know, one on top of the other, the legs are crossed, so if he leapt to his feet, he'd fall flat on his face, so he's, again, he's locked into that immobile pose. So something about that, this inability to, to, to actually, whereas the little cupidy guy here is sort of scampering around, just getting busy with absolutely everything. This is extraordinarily interesting looking shaped piece of stuff, uh, which is, again, presumably significant in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. Uh, so I think you are leaning on the fact that you're taking for granted great amount of knowledge on the part of the viewer. But basically the, the, the principal problem with melancholia is that it leads rapidly towards insanity. Because again, you're so frustrated that you can't do anything, you just go basically sort of go off a cliff. So I think what he's talking about in a, in a sense is relating it to the artistic temperament in general. Remember what I was saying about the disenio in terror, the disenio as terror. Inspiration between the ears running around, one of the ideas S them are getting it done. And that's the tough part. And that's what drives you to drink and melancholy and everything else. Because uh, you just cannot ever quite match up the ideas in your head to what you can actually get done with your hands. Uh, and that, and you know, one of the great, uh, any artistic writing books, music, what have you. Um, and I think, again, what it, it illustrates I think, is Dura's own extraordinary knowledge, perhaps his own frustration. He's only realizing that he cannot quite achieve the perfection that the Italians had got. Uh, and that, so it's in a way, it's a sort of self portrait. The artist with a sort of mental block somehow. But I mean, you can read up some more about it and, and find out all sorts of other different and intriguing ideas, I'm sure. But um, whatever it is. That's one aspect of, of that. But the other two that we'll get to next time, because I, I don't want to, these are the, to me, the absolute best of Dura's work. Um, the idea of the, the active life and the contemplative life. The soldier riding into battle, as it were, and the scholar in his study.
this, this, this is the, I've showed you this before, this is, I don't get any better than this. So we'll look at this, uh, these two, that'll take a bit, at the beginning of next, of Wednesday, and then we're going to look mostly at, at Holbein. So you have to read out some English history, because it's all to do with the life and times of Henry VIII. If that program, the Tudors, happens to come on, watch it. It's not very good, really, but gets you a little bit into what on the, the, the palace of creeds and things. Find it. Henry VIII is the one with the six wives, which doesn't seem to be to be, to be a very smart thing to do. I think one is enough. But that's my problem. <laughs> anyway, so uh, if you haven't done your paper, for God's sake, remember the, the rules? I, I, put it, I put it on, on my course today. Email it to me, because otherwise I'm sucking off too much of it. After next Monday, I'm not accepting any papers at all. Just, can you listen for a second? Yeah. After next Monday, I'll read today, no paper for ever excuse will be accepted. And don't, don't forget what I said, in the in the summer clauses, I can't put in a, an incomplete mark. Everything has to be finalized. After the final exam, that's it. Uh -huh. I saw that. Okay, so any questions for God's sake, email me with a phone number if you have to, just to get quick answers. Otherwise, we'll see you all on Wednesday.